Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the December last meeting of 2019 meeting of the Grand Rapids Edmund Village School District Board of Education. Thank you all for being here. And would you please rise and join us in the pleasure of the evening? Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Individual with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for coming out in uh, some inclement weather and joining us this evening. And the students, thank you all for being here when I know you've got a little bit of work on your plate before, uh, before you get to the end of this week. But would you please take a moment? Mr. Cheese? Here. Mr. Miller? Here. Dr. Foreman? Here. Mr. Eden? Here. Mr. Wolf? Here. Mr. Wolf. Here. Mr. Wolf. Here. All right, this is my favorite part of the night, no offense, um, <laughs> where we get to commend a lot of people that are sitting in the audience. So I'm going to mix it up a little bit um, <coughs> and talk a little bit about the career of our exiting principal, uh, Gil Burris. So we would like to acknowledge and celebrate the career and retirement of Gil Burris. Mrs. Burris is the principal of Granville Intermediate School. During her tenure, GIS has truly become one of the best intermediate schools in the state. Uh, Gail started in Granville in 2008 after a long tenure in Columbus City Schools. Mrs. Burris brought her with her a passion for instructional leadership and a love of students. Gail was a first and second grade teacher before becoming a principal. Gail won numerous awards during her career, including a Golden Apple, Educator of the Year, and Exemplary, Exemplary Principal Award, to mention a few. There are many things I admire about Gail Burris, but I'd like to highlight her passion and commitment to her craft in the end of her career. Gail is truly leading at the top of her class. She has demonstrated an ability to adapt, adjust, and persevere through many uh, adversities to get to this point in her career and her this point in time. I actually have the pleasure of honoring her tenure in both Columbus and Granville. So on behalf of thousands of students during your tenure that you have influenced in your career, thank you. Well done and enjoy a well-deserved retirement. Come on up. because each one's individual, just like all of our educators in Granville schools. And so, Gail, you're one of a kind, and we wish you the best, and I thought I'd get it over early. So, <laughs> you, would, you got to present later. So, congratulations on behalf of the Board of Education. Tonight we get to recognize the Granville girls soccer team who had a stellar year on many levels this fall. With another undefeated league record of 6-0 for the fifth straight year and outscoring opponents 39-3 to win the Licking County League in as many years. The team played the most challenging non-conference schedule in the state for Division II schools. It largely consisted of top Division I programs in Central Ohio, as well as the state runner-up in Division II. The team finished the year with an overall record of 13-5-5, and a true memory-filled ride through the district and regional uh, finals, and outscored opponents throughout the tournament 37-4. In the end, the team fell short in the state semifinal to the eventual champion, uh, Kettering Alter. So tonight we'd like to recognize the captains, um, girls, please come up as your name is called and recognize your coach, uh, Scott Forrester, Zeke, and Sam. But I'd like to uh, bring up Alex Sokolik, Maddie Bradenberg, and Ella Rogers. Congratulations. <laughs>
picture over here. <laughs> I didn't even know that one. Congratulations. I'm reflecting, I think the girls cross country team and the girls soccer team are probably the most commended um, sports that we've ever had uh, at board meetings because you've had a lot of success. Which brings me to the Granville girls cross country team, which uh, their season concluded this year by beating 152 teams and only losing two seven. Uh, three of those losses would be to the eventual state champions, Lexington. The remaining loss were to schools three times our size. The girls went on a run in the postseason winning every meet in October. Riley Zink set a re meet record at the Backwoods breaking 11 minutes in the two mile and the LCL record and school record going 17 minutes and 56 seconds. Riley was one of only a few girls in Division II that broke 18 minutes minutes this season. I know I have to drive in order to break that, so uh, kudos to you, Riley. Um, in October, the girls out outscored the competition by an average of 48 points. They won the LCL championship for the 12th year in a row. It was their 10th district championship in the last 11 years, despite moving up a division throughout that decade. The girls outscored their opponents by 67 points to win their sixth regional title. In November, these girls went to the state tournament ranked number two, and by the, by the coaches association, and despite their efforts, were not able to defeat Lexington. Grandma girls were state runners up this year, behind all Ohio finish of senior Riley Sink and sophomore Regina Rose. The Grandma girls are one of only a few teams in Ohio that have qualified for the state tournament and placed in the top 10. Girls, please come forward with your coaches, Bart Smith, Jim Green, Ross Hartley, and Chrissy Rogerson, so you can be recognized. So we have first team all league, Ella Johnson, Regina Rose, Dylan Kretschmer, uh, Jenna Uncafer, and Riley Zink. We have second team all league, Annika Green, um, all district, Ella Johnson, Regina Rose, Dylan, Riley, all region, Ella, Regina, Jenna, <laughs> Jenna Riley, all Ohio, Regina, Riley, and we had our alternate, Becky Miller, also representing us at the state track meet, so, or cross country meet. So most importantly, we are proud of our girls and their efforts in the classroom and on the athletic field. Regina, Dylan, Jenna, Annika, and Riley were also recognized as academic All Ohio. Congratulations to all of you. Please come on up. student data to the Department of Education, a process we know as EMIS. 
Um, it is not fun. It's painful. <laughs> the requirements change every single day. I'm going off script. Um, and, and Lisa does it better than anyone. Uh, a critical piece of professional growth in this position, of this position is a plan that we know as the certified EMS professional. Lisa <coughs> embraced that process and she was able to finish the requirements passing grade on the comprehensive assessment covering EMIS topics, as well as uh, also required before the member can earn that designation. So we are very proud of your accomplishments as an EMIS professional, Lisa, and we are pleased to recognize you. Thank you for going to <laughs> rubbing off. Um, but she didn't get emotional. Well, <laughs> I was looking directly at you. Um, and there's something about uh, the more fuzzy. Yeah. Yeah, when, um, when he said he was talking about things that were not fun and painful. Yeah. yeah. That's right. That's right. Russ has been on the board for over a decade. Giving of his time, talent, and intellect, Russ has served in many roles on the board. Mr. Janice's business acumen has helped the district manage its fiscal resources responsibly and supported multiple levies during his tenure. But it's most noteworthy that Russ's legacy is centered around the health and well-being of our students. Mr. Janice has always had an uncanny ability to articulate the board's perspective in a clear and concise manner, no matter what the topic. We have accomplished many things during his tenure including hiring the two best treasurers and superintendent in the state, <laughs> um, approving the land lab, um, a new mission statement, the portrait of a graduate, multiple program revisions, professional development offerings, and champion, championing economic development, just to mention a few. But Russ's continuous improvement mentality made him a perfect fit for the Granville School Board of Education. The board will miss his steady hand, his calm voice, and his compelling oratory. As the instructional leader, I will miss his guidance and board perspective. I consider Russ to be a friend, colleague, and advocate for public education. On behalf of the entire community, we are indebted to your service uh, to the Granville Schools. Thank you very much. And we have also another Last long blue eyes as you're retiring from your service. serve on the board, but you should pick Russ Janice. <laughs> because Russ has just been fantastic. You know, a continuous supporter of the schools, running levy committees before becoming a board member, and, and uh, you know, his, his business and legal advice for the board has been extremely valuable. So thank you for all your service. You know, I'd choose you over me any day, <laughs> but I understand that you've uh, served your time, and we really do appreciate all that you've done for us. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much for all the time. And I, 
appreciated all the conversations that we've had over issues and, and governance, and um, you will definitely be missed on board. I have, we have fantastic colleagues, and I welcome our new members to see a You will definitely be missed, and um, I hope you'll stay involved. Russ, I want to thank you for your commitment to our community, our kids, and our schools. Um, your outstanding work in leadership on the board. From this board member's perspective, you set the bar awful high. Um, but I really appreciate your commitment, your friendship. Um, wish you and Susan a lot of luck. And I heard you might have a little time on your hands now. And you're going to be involved in something in the Union Township. I know. <laughs> you know, best of luck with that, and uh, can't thank you enough for everything you've done. And not only me, but the board. Thank you. I think I remember when Tony resigned as well, and, and um, being absolutely stunned and elated to hear that you would consider our shoes on the because I didn't think we would get that lucky. <laughs> we did. Thank you. We're not going to give you the last word because we know how long that takes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. I'll wait so, till 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 board. Yes. 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 We have our student uh, uh, body president. So okay. Tori's going to get her report, and then people can head on. Um, I'm Tori Bergstrom, and as student body president of Granville High School, I have the privilege of addressing the board and all of you and updating um, on what is going on at GHS. On behalf of the student body, Mr. Brown, I'd like to begin by saying that we would not mind the delay tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was my daughter's birthday today, and I, I was in trouble. <laughs> So, first of all, the music program just finished up their week-long holiday concert, Mayhem. We estimate that the music program performed for over 2,000 people, which is incredible. With three full-length concerts, with an additional three coffee hours, three assemblies for the high school, intermediate school, and elementary school, along with rehearsals all week long, I can affirm that Granville High School is in the holiday spirit. Also, winter sports are beginning to take off. The girls' basketball team won their game on Friday by a landslide, and the boys' basketball team won their past two games on Tuesday and Saturday. Indoor track just participated in their first meet yesterday at Tiffin, and wrestling is going well so far, with the team working hard at recent tournaments. Bowling matches have begun, and the swim team competed at a prestigious meet at OSU over the weekend. Finally, the Newark Generals are continuing to sweep the league. So, as aforementioned, this week is midterms, so the holiday frenzy continues with midterms Wednesday through Friday. Students are busy studying and preparing for another deserved no homework weekend, which as a reminder is just as great as it sounds. No homework <laughs> unless one has to complete any makeup or missing work. So in a few short days, Granville High School will be happily in winter break, spending time with family and enjoying the holidays and snow. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know. I don't know what I'm doing. She's a polite. 
going to take your last night off. <laughs> so I'm going to briefly introduce Dane Gash, and he can wave right there. Um, Dane is going to be on the agenda for approval uh, as the uh, new board attorney. As you know, um, Don Scriven rep represented this district for over 20 years. Um, passed away last year. We went underwent a uh, process of identifying new board counsel. Um, Dane has a fantastic reputation. Um, he's known as, as an exemplary attorney. Um, he is very knowledgeable around school law, labor relations, um, gen generally anything education. Um, he went to the University of Virginia, um, University, <laughs> University of Michigan, and the Ohio State University. So he finished on a high note. <laughs> he, is, he is listed um, as one of the uh, best lawyers in America, and you're going to get to know him a little bit more during the executive session as we talk about uh, negotiate, uh, intending negotiations. So thank you, Dane, for being here, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, next is a board policy update. Uh, first reading, the only policy that OSBA recommended that we um, tweak is the uh, board agenda and um, <coughs> let's see, board agenda, yeah, board agenda um, policies. And um, they're really just suggesting that we tweak the language around the consent agenda and the approval process for the board um, agenda up front. And honestly, we have kind of a casual uh, board agenda um, from the standpoint of we don't necessarily approve it at the beginning of each meeting, and then as it changes, we you know don't go through that formal vote process. So uh, but we think that is the best practice to do. Um, there are some times where things change on the consent agenda. Um, like tonight, we had a person that was going to take an unpaid leave, but circumstances changed, she will no longer have to take that leave. So um, I think in the future, you know, having this policy in place will follow that practice. So um, that's this is the first reading, second reading will be in January, only we'll that approval at that time. And that's the only thing I have for the policy update. Um, that takes us to monthly financial report. Yep. Uh, the monthly financial report is for November, um, so there's really not a lot to comment on since we just updated the forecast. Expenditures and revenue are in line with um, and include most of what I discussed during the five year forecast. So I'm going to skip over that and jump to page five the capital budget. <clears throat> just a couple of items to note here that we moved out of the general project line item. Uh, we are repairing and replacing the high school theater lift that goes down into the pit area um, to comply with accessibility. And there's also some damage to the sign at the high school. So we um, have some money set aside to take care of that, as well as uh, replace the domestic hot water pump at the high school. Um, so those three items have been itemized in the capital budget. Um, and then moving on to page six uh, was an ad from last month. This is something that shows all funds. So that's not something we've typically um, looked at in the past in the monthly financial report, but I did want to throw it in here. Um, and really what this, what I'm trying to show you with this particular graph is that a majority of, a majority of our funds um, are coming in around 40 to 50% spent and being through November, um, is exactly where we would expect those to see. Um, exceptions to those two are items that pay out unevenly throughout the year. So you can see the um, funds that are closer to 100% spent include the classroom facilities maintenance fund, bond retirement, permanent improvement, since those um, projects took place over the summer. So that's um, you would expect to see this time of year. And the items closer to the top, um, there's several grants that uh, get spent either later in the year or just don't have any salary benefits in them that um, are expended each month. 
and that is, and then the cash reconciliation on page seven. Any questions about financial report? Questions? So the bond retirement is one that's ahead. What was the question? Yeah, that, that so bond retirement is usually in two payments, um, but you have either um, principal and interest in December, whereas in like closer to June, you would just have interest. So that is pretty typical um, where you would expect to see based on that um, debt schedule. Okay. Yeah, most of the big ones are right in the middle, which is where you expect to with the year and so forth. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, we'll move right into our CIP presentations, and I'm going to invite our four principals up um, to start talking a little bit about their building to units improvement plans. Uh, just to frame this conversation as Travis is walking up, uh, each building has a continuous improvement plan that focuses on the areas that um, they want to see improvement in, <laughs> uh, recognizing the strengths and areas of improvement, part of our continuous improvement mentality. And um, that's, I think, why we continue to improve on just about every metric that um, is out there. So with that, Travis Morris, our elementary principal. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. First of all, I want to say on behalf of all the building administrators, just thank you for your leadership in this last year. And um, Randall's a great place to be. It's one of the best school districts in the state for a reason. It's because of the leadership all the way down to everyone who works in the individual building. So thank you. Thank you all for your leadership. Um, Mr. Janice, uh, thank you so much for all of your work and dedication and on behalf of the principals. Uh, I think you could easily say that your legacy can be seen in all four buildings throughout the district. So we really appreciate all the work that you've done and look forward to Cecile being a part of the team and, um, and helping the lead as well. So I'm going to jump in and talk about the elementary school. I think you're going to see a theme um, for the elementary building. And it's going to be two things. One is to be really refining our instruction. Um, and then a focus on student well-being. I'll kind of break those down a little bit as, as we go through. So just taking some, some of our strengths, and I'm not going to read this verbatim for you. Um, what I want to really highlight is, um, again, once again, all of our third graders met the third grade guarantee through one of the provisions that's allowed for that for education. So we're really excited about that because um, the, this test, the state tests have some pretty high standards, so we're able to meet those expectations uh, without actually you know, teaching to the test as, as we used to we also are really excited because we finally have finished completing last the uh, spring of last year, rolling out all of our resources to our K-3 balanced literacy. As you know, for the last five years, we've really been focusing on creating that balanced literacy instruction so that we're not just focusing on just reading or just writing, we're kind of infusing all of it together and infusing those with the regular content as well. Um, so that took a lot of work with our instructional coaches uh, as well as learning some new paradigms and making some shifts in our thinking and our instructional strategies but also having the resources in place to do that and to do that well. Um, and so we are finding, finally able to complete the, that, that rollout. Um, so now we are in the place of, great, we did that, now we need to make some tweaks and some changes because we know what's working and what's not working and, and adjusting from there. Um, always excited to share that at the end of the school year, by the end of the school year, every single student receives an awesome at uh, one point in the school year. Uh, an awesome is, uh, if you ever walk into elementary school, there's a bulletin board right, right inside the main door and it really just says awesome. It's basically we're giving students, we're recognizing students for their past leadership, we refer to it. Um, just good character skills and good leadership. Uh, our goal is not to make it an arbitrary, we're just going to make sure someone gets one just to get one. We are intentional about identifying for when we see a student exhibiting a strength. So we don't just, just give them one just to give them one. We make sure that it's very intentional and we celebrate with them and that sort of thing. So uh, it's always one of those um, highlights I love to share. That being said, we have some areas to improve, and this is where I think you'll see those themes of, of refining instruction and a focus on student well-being. Uh, even though we have uh, really kind of finished rolling out those resources, we're always going to be working towards improving our balance of their framework. There's always new research, there's always new approaches. The kids change over the course of years, the needs change, technology changes. And so we see all those, those different things happening, so we want to always make sure we're refining that. Uh, and the workshop structure is really a gradual release approach. The idea that teachers do a lot of modeling up front and then working with students to achieve goals and then gradually releasing them to doing, doing so independently. Uh, it also involves a lot of small group interaction and a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction with teachers and students. Uh, 
And to do that well, there needs to be a lot of uh, intentional assessment that takes place. So now that we have some, we, we started off the K6 literacy process with looking at assessments, now we've kind of been un, un, uh, unfolded the instructional piece of it. Now it's going back and saying, are these the assessments that are working for us? Uh, and if not, then what do we need to do? So we're actually piloting uh, a new assessment in the elementary building. It's been used at the Iterate School for the last several years. So we're piloting and transitioning to a new assessment called a benchmark reading assessment uh, that we're hoping to, um, to roll out to all the classrooms next year. Uh, but again, it's just part of that refining of the instructional process. At the same time, we're also looking at that workshop, that gradual release approach in terms of mathematics, the idea of modeling, you know, working with students to solve problems, and then freeing them up to independence, whether that's in small group or, or individual independence. Uh, we found such great success with that in the literacy approach. The teachers just naturally started making that connection because this is something we'd be doing in our mathematical instruction as well. We have several teachers already doing it who are taking on leadership roles, to help work with other staff members to be professional development and so forth. <coughs> and again, we're just finding some great success with that. All of that really encompasses providing that effective intervention. We're, we're always going to have students that, aren't, that need a little bit of extra support to be successful in the classroom. So we're constantly looking for how can we best approach that. One of the beauties of the workshop approach is that it creates an environment where that can happen successfully uh, and, and very seamlessly. So instead of everybody sitting and listening to the teacher talk for 40 minutes, it's about 10 minutes listening to the teacher talk, and that gives another 30 minutes to really for the teacher to really individualize that instruction, whether it's in a small group setting or in our one-on-one -on -one setting. Uh, so again, we're, we're, our instructional coaches are working with us as well uh, to really kind of refine that practice to make sure we meet those needs. And assessment takes a big piece in this too. We, have, we are um, we um, initiated a new reading or a new math assessment called Acadian's Math. You've ever heard of Dibbles? Uh, Dibbles reading is basically uh, nonsense words, uh, letter sounds, uh, fluency reading. So there, we now have a math version of that called Acadian's Math, which is looking at very skill specifics. It provides us in progress monitoring, so every week we can assess those skills and make sure that we're making progress towards those skills. It allows teachers to really dig down deep and really understand what really is the student struggling with and how can we support them. Uh, obviously, we want to continue refining the implementation of PBL in our classrooms. Uh, all of our classrooms are experimenting with different PBLs this year. Um, sometimes it's refining the ones we've done in the past, sometimes it's, it's something brand new. Uh, we have a classroom that has, um, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's one of those gardens that's an aqua garden where basically it has the lights that hang down and we're growing vegetables. Uh, the arugula is amazing. So if you ever want to stop in Mrs. Mullen's room, there's a little bit of kick in that arugula. Um, <laughs> I'm not a big fan of kale, but I was happy to put the kale in the smoothie because it was also very, very, very good. Um, but just taking something as, sim as simple as that and, and growing some plants in the classroom and turning it into a, to a great PBL. Uh, we also have some several PBLs that are community-based PBLs that, that we're excited to see un uh, unravel throughout the year. Uh, our kindergarten uh, classrooms walked around um, the, the, uh, the village early in September and in October and got to visit the firehouse, the library, a couple of museums to really understand the community a little bit better. And they'll be revisiting in the spring uh, to, do, to, to build that PBL as well. So you can see just a lot of uh, refining of the instruction that we're doing in the classrooms, uh, really trying to make sure we're providing the best possible instruction for our kiddos. But at the same time, you know, the world is different than what it used to be when we were all in school, where it was instruction, it was all academics. And uh, I know for a while there was kind of this idea that the social emotional needs of kids would just kind of happen and it would all take care of itself. But we know now that's not true. We, our teachers and our staff, our principals, all of our leadership, we need to be aware that we have to be very intentional about meeting the social emotional needs of our kids because it's just the world we live in, which is very different than when we were all in school. Uh, and so that's a major focus for us at the elementary school. Um, all of our staff was trained in PACS Next Steps training this, this past August. Uh, if you're familiar with PACS, that is our positive behavior intervention support system. Uh, and really it's, it's building good leadership and, and recognizing that leadership and helping students make positive choices. The next steps training involves some trauma-informed training, understanding how trauma impacts students and how we can respond to that, be responsive to that um, in a positive way, and also be proactive in making sure we're creating environments in our classroom um, that will, you know, that will allow kids to feel safe and successful as well. Uh, so it was really excited to see that. From that, we've had some additional training. Um, five of our teachers attended a PACS coach training, so now we have PACS coaches in our building who are able to visit classrooms and provide support to teachers. And it's not about <coughs> judging their classroom management, it's about, again, refining what they're doing in the classroom to make all the students feel comfortable and successful and inclusive in the classroom. We also had just finished a book study in the fall, and the book was All Learning, Social and Emotional. Essentially, aligning with PACS and a lot of the graduate, 
what do we need to do as educators to make students feel successful in the classroom? It is different than when we were in school. Uh, the teachers really responded well to it, making a lot of those connections with what we're doing with PACS. But also it was a great time because it really aligned well with the portion of the graduate. So as we're unpacking that portion of the graduate and talking about that instruction, we're also talking about that portion of the graduate and how we meet the needs of our kiddos on a daily basis, socially and emotionally. Some of the work that's going to come out of that, which I'm really excited about, you may, you may hear about Calm Corner for Peace Corners. Oh, nearly every classroom has one of those now where it's a space where students can go and take two minutes just to come and relax and they have different activities that they can do to kind of help them relax if they're feeling anxious or upset or sad or whatever it might be. Um, we also have, um, when we return back in January, we, we will have two Lego walls in the building, uh, one on each end of the building. Those Lego walls serve multiple purposes. One of them is working on those fine motor skills that all of our elementary students can benefit from. Um, those collaboration skills as we use those um, as part of our coding activities that we're using uh, technology instruction. Um, but also research has shown just putting Legos together can be a great just break for a student to really help them calm themselves down. Uh, so we'll be talking with the kids about how we use this appropriately, talking with our teachers about how we can definitely use that PTO as helping to fund those for us. So just very excited that, uh, that we have some of those things uh, coming forward. We have a student wellness committee that meets once a month at the elementary school. Um, because of the student wellness committee that we have the Common Corners, because of that committee that we started the book study that we, we have chosen, uh, which is actually going to do a new book study in the spring, which is on restorative practices, uh, and using uh, formal circle discussions to help students with some conflict management, things like that that, that might be happening. So again, focusing on refining our instruction, but also making sure we're meeting those needs of our kiddos uh, as, as they go through, you know, to try to navigate the difficult world that we're, we're in. Uh, it's hard to think that a seven-year-old has to navigate a difficult world, but I have first graders with cell phones, uh, and those first graders have cell phones, and they're on social media. We may not like that, but we have to make sure we have to be aware of that and know that that is impacting our kiddos. And every student walks in with something that they're dealing with on a daily basis, whether it's hunger or just, I'm just sad because I miss my mom. But we want to make sure we're helping our kiddos uh, navigate those feelings and address those feelings appropriately. So the initiatives that we've, um, we've developed to, to accomplish those, we really kind of reflecting on um, what I just talked about, developing those shared understanding of those practices, really working on that workshop approach in math uh, and, and then literacy. Uh, our focus, we have a large focus in terms of the literacy piece on the writing this year. Um, that is the last of our resources that we, that we kind of rolled out for that balanced literacy approach. Uh, writing needs to study, uh, you may have heard of Coffins or Teachers College, uh, that's writing needs to study. Uh, it aligns really well with our uh, reading needs to study that we've been using for the last several years but also aligns really well with foundations, which you remember was our uh, products instruction that we began using. Um, and it also, started, it also really aligns well with um, some of the assessments we've been doing in the classroom. Uh, one of the nice things about writing into study is that um, it allows for that workshop approach, and it also has some freedom built into it, so our teachers can implement portrait of graduate, talking about resiliency and adaptability and those sort of things uh, as they're going through some writing pieces. Uh, Project-based learning is still a focus. Uh, they talked about refining the implementation of PACS across the building. So all of our teachers went to the PACS Next Steps training, and um, once a month we're talking as a staff about, so what are we doing to make sure that all of our students are experiencing PACS in a positive way, uh, and, are, and uh, that we as a staff are making sure we're making it consistent. <clears throat> One of the things we know that most, is most powerful for elementary age students is consistency. The expectations in kindergarten don't change very much when I go to first grade, don't change very much when I go to second grade or third grade. So if our building expectations uh, are the same, no matter if I'm a kindergartner or a third grader, when I walk through the hall, this is the expectation. When I'm sitting in the lunchroom, this is the expectation. This is how I treat others on the playground. So if those are consistent, that's what help makes our kids feel successful and feel safe emotionally at school. I right, also continue on packing for a graduate. Um, it's been exciting to hear our teachers using the language of the Portrait graduates as I'm walking through classrooms or even staff meetings and in conversations. They're just using that, that language and that lingo, uh, which is really exciting. And now you start to hear some of the students using it as well just shouting out, look, I'm being resilient, or look how adaptable I was, because they know what that means now, and it's really, really exciting. Um, we have several teachers that are having the kids help them kind of understand what those means, because for a first grader to understand resiliency is a little bit tough, and so we share with them what our district definitions of those are, right? Uh, but then let's talk as a first grader, what does that mean for us in a first grade classroom? So uh, my, I'm hoping that by the time we reach the high school, it will be well and great and do our kiddos for sure. So I wanted to share with you some of our uh, uh, lower, or granular goals to, to help accomplish these larger goals. Uh, Mrs. Thatcher is our school counselor. Um, 
she spends uh, time in the classroom at least once a month. Sometimes she's in each classroom twice a month. Um, do lots of lessons, too good for drugs, as you're familiar with. Um, she, she does most of those lessons. Um, she also talks about zones of regulation, which is a strategy and tool that we use uh, to help our students with some of the emotional needs. Um, each month when she's in the classroom, she's teaching every single student a strategy. So it's the same strategy each for the whole month, throughout the whole building. So every student is going to expose that strategy. It's strategies to help them to calm down if they're feeling frustrated, if they're feeling sad, if they're feeling upset. If they're just feeling a little bit exuberant and just need to kind of you know, calm their body and get ready to learn. Uh, so every student is getting exposed to those. We're also communicating those with parents. So the parents are, know what those strategies are. and can also work with them, their kiddos at home if they, if they so need to. Now, our reading intervention teachers, uh, Mrs. Cosby and Mrs. Archshorn, uh, as we have been working through the balanced literacy approach and the workshop approach, have also done a great job of adapting their program to meet the needs of how the classroom looks different, so how does our program look different. And so one of the things they really identified is we really need to be very intentional about talking about our assessments and the teacher's assessments and how do those align and how do those look each, at different points in the year. So they are collaborating to adjust their assessments and collaborating with classroom teachers to talk about those assessments to make sure that we're meeting the best needs of our kiddos. And our specialist teachers uh, every year do a nice job of really looking at how can we how can we work together to meet the, kid, meet the needs of our kids so it doesn't feel like specials are an isolated event. But Spanish is not an isolated event from say music or art. And so they, they work together to collaborate and provide experiences for kids for kiddos. So if I go to Spanish, it doesn't feel like Spanish. It kind of feels like art today. And if I go to music class, it kind of feels like art as well, because we're doing some of that cross-curricular cross work. And these are a few of our grade level initiatives. Again, you're looking at refining what we're doing in our instruction, whether it's just looking at how can we, at a kindergarten level, make flexible groups so that children are doing math based on their skilled needs, not necessarily this is what's next in the program. Um, and also looking at um, the, the needs of our, the emotional needs of our students. Our first grade teachers, uh, each classroom takes a character skill um, each quarter and will teach the rest of the grade level. So each classroom four times a year teaches about a character, a character trait or a skill that they can use and those align with PACs as well as a portion of graduate. And then you can see their second and third grade continuing again to refine that instruction. Are there any questions? I just wanted to say you're, you've done a fantastic job with the robots. I really, really, really enjoy that. Thank you, Travis. Travis, thank you. Gail, Tracy, come on up. I can get emotional now, Gail, if you want. Before I start, let me just go off script a little bit. I couldn't say it earlier, and I'm going to try to not get emotional again, but I just want to say thank you to all of you for allowing me the opportunity and the privilege to be the principal of the Olympia School. It's been a great ride. And I've enjoyed every single minute of it, even when there's been headaches. It's uh, been great. And I am leaving that building in great hands with Tracy. Uh, you've done a good hire here, and she's going to do a great job. And I'm just up there. So I'm going to see you uh, so uh, I'm going to take care of building strengths first. Um, the, uh, I would say the first probably four or five bullets are really all about our state report card. I know that's not our whole business and what we're here for is to um, talk about testing and how we're doing test-wise, but this is something the intermediate school is very proud of, that uh, this will be our third year in a row that we have earned an A in every single area in our report card and we continue to have our performance index score go up, plus I just have to remind Matt Durst of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Um, uh, the next bullets are about our sixth grade survey. This was something that uh, our numbers, I would say four years ago, were down in the 80s. And it wasn't something we were very proud of because it was something we really tried to create an environment for all of our students, four through six, um, that is an environment that they feel safe, they feel like they're learning, they feel like they're challenged. Um, they want to come to school, they want to do and follow the expectations. So last year, our survey, we were really, really happy with our results in every single area. And as you go through, I'm not going to read all of these to you, 
But as you go through, you can see in every single one of our areas on our sixth grade exit survey, we improved. And we, did, we talked to our sixth graders before they took it this year. We wanted to express to them, when you take the survey, we want you to think about fourth, fifth, and sixth, your whole experience at the, at the intermediate school. So this is something that we were really, really proud of. And there were certain things that when we went over this, when I went over this with the staff, we could point to very specific things we did that we felt were the, the cause of those increases um, going up. So um, that's what some of these are. Uh, the last four bullets are to talk about the whole child, that we are in this business at the intermediate school, not just for test scores and not just to get straight A's on the report card, but we're looking at the whole child as well. So we put a lot of emphasis, and I have to credit Mrs. Urban, our phys ed teacher for this, for our fuel up to play 60 and our archery. Um, last year, the students had to do an application to be a national student ambassador for fuel up to play 60. Um, they submit that application, and then the organization you know, mm -hmm. chooses ambassadors throughout the whole United States of schools that are participating in this program. And we had seven students last year from the intermediate school that were actually chosen to be student ambassadors. And they um, attended, it's a three-day summit. This year it was in Cleveland. So it was up at the um, Brown Stadium. They stayed at Case Western and dorms at Case Western. And then they did all kinds of activities with them. So this is huge. Typically a school might get two or three. But for us to have seven, that was, and there were over 100 kids that attended this summit. So it was quite impressive that we had seven of our students that qualified for that. Um, our archery club continues to compete at state and national world tournaments. Um, that's been something that uh, I think that was our sixth year in a row that we have competed at all those. And again, I credit two of those, those two things to um, Mayor DeGurvin. The last two things are, are things that I hope you're starting to see a trend from what you heard from Mr. Morris because we really are trying to build a K-6 continuum with our math and our language arts. So we put this on one of our building strengths because we have all of our math teachers have now attended a math workshop, a PD session. We all have common language and common understanding about what math workshop is and how we're going to use that model to refine our instruction, like Mr. Morris talked about, um, to meet our individual academic needs. So we did list that as a strength for us because we feel that's something that we have now solidified, have that common understanding, and now we're just moving forward to refine that. And then the same thing around our uh, ballot literacy program. Um, I think the Homegrown Institute that uh, you guys all allowed us to have last year really, really kick-started our staff. That was some of the best people they said they ever had. And our ELA, when you walk from room to room to room, you can just hear the common language. You can see the common understanding that's happening. Um, our fifth grade teachers even said, wow, those four years <coughs> came up this year. We didn't have to teach them what stamina reading was. They could do it for longer than five or 10 minutes. They, did, they understood our race paragraph. So we're starting to see all of that carry over. And hopefully, we'll see that start to carry over, that Lisa whoops, will start to see that uh, at the middle school as our sixth graders transfer into seventh grade. So those were our uh, building strengths. These are our improvement areas. So we will continue to refine our project-based learning. Um, last year, uh, each grade level, or I should say each teacher implemented at least one. Many of them did more than one. Uh, this year, I challenged them when we had our coaches to not only try to think of a new PBL that they could do, but I also asked them to take it one step further and how could they implement and incorporate portrait uh, portrait progression with that. Because there are so many attributes that the both kind of dovetail together that I challenged them to try to start to dub those together a, a little bit more, which runs into that second bullet that we are in the process of unpacking the portrait of graduate competencies and starting to design them and starting to have that common understanding across the entire building um, so that we can start recognizing those and start pointing those out and students can start doing that with each other as well. 
Along that towards our graduate, you all know we have a book room that we use uh, during our ballot literacy program. So we're going to start starting to identify books that um, if you're looking for a book that you can read with your child, your students around resiliency or responsibility, any of those four graduate competencies, we're starting to grow that collection and we're starting to make a list. So if someone says, wow, I really want to work with my kids with responsibility, here's a book that you could read to help with that. Uh, we went one to one this year, um, thanks to Glenn Welker. So we are really trying to uh, increase our integration of technology across our content areas so that the students really are using those Chromebooks and they're not just sitting there collecting dust and so there's a lot of money put into that. Um, I have to credit Beth Downing, our technology coach, because she has really done a lot of pushing into the classroom. Uh, you saw her here with the um, VR kits and some of the other things that she shared with you that evening. So um, if you ever come out to the building and walk into a classroom, you'll be able to see some of the technology that's taking place um, with the one-to-one. -one. And then obviously we'll continue um, our learning around units of study, uh, really looking at resources to increase our student growth um, and making sure that we're meeting individual needs. Same thing with math, it's very similar to what Travis already talked about. Um, our two coaches get together every once in a while and talk, and then um, all of us, uh, Travis, myself, and the two coaches, and Tracy, get together so that we can continue to build that K-6 um, continuum. And the last thing is to continue with our character ed program. We can credit a lot of things we're doing with our character ed program so for those increases in our sixth grade exit surveys. Uh, we instituted a student pledge last year. We really wanted our students to tar start taking ownership and really understand why do I come to school. It's not just because mom and dad sent me to school, but why do I really come to school. So we have a student pledge that we recite every single morning in the classroom. Um, and any time that a student is having any kind of struggles or any kind of, like they come to my office for a discipline issue, we just refer it right back to the student pledge. What is it that you're not following the student pledge? How can you change your behavior using the student pledge? So this has been something that team leaders and I uh, developed, and then we had some very specific instruction with the students so they would really understand what that student pledge meant. And that's the activities that I was talking about that we really feel increased our percentages on that um, exit survey. And Tracy is taking over from here. Well, clearly. Um, <laughs> okay, so here. Um, I would like to say that um, obviously all of our initiatives you know, for this year moving forward, um, the, the, the teacher leaders, Gail and I, um, this has been uh, working with Molly, uh, our instructional coach, this is very specific, very intentional to make sure that we are directly, explicitly aligned with the areas of growth that Gail just talked with you about. So as she said, the expansion of the project-based learning, um, I have to tell you that this is so exciting. I've been in several other districts, and to walk through our hallways, go into our pods, go into the classrooms, where the pod area, everything's an extension of the classroom, and our students, there's a vibe, there's a buzz when you walk through, and, and the excitement of the teachers and the, and the students, and they have parent volunteers, I, it's, it's just, Wonderful to see these parent volunteers, grades four through six, coming in, really getting their hands on being part of our PBLs. Uh, it's something I haven't seen in other districts before, uh, whether it was in Grandview, you know, Winchester, up in Cleveland. Uh, this is this is where it's at. This is definitely something that our teachers have embraced, um, our families are embracing, our students uh, get very excited talking <coughs> about these experiences. So um, I'm excited to see this progress. Uh, as, as we've talked about, the portrait of a graduate. This is, um, we're, we're hearing those words that are coming up in our pre and uh, uh, post conferences with our teachers. How are they uh, bringing these to light into the classroom? Teachers are coming up with ideas that they're, that our students, this is, we're pointing it out, we're noticing, as we've talked about, resiliency. We're noticing, um, you know, students taking responsibility. So we're continuing with uh, our, our POG. As Gail said, our project center and our one room Chromebooks. Uh, what a uh, valuable uh, opportunity this is for our students to have those Chromebooks. They have ownership and they're learning responsibilities. I'm incredibly impressed where these students take care of them. Uh, 
Uh, you know, I've been in other districts where the, the, you know, the Chromebooks are being destroyed. Our students, they really appreciate having them in, uh, to, to watch them, to walk into a classroom and to having students have their individualized instruction and our teachers using these with, with fidelity and intentionality um, is, is, is something that we really will continue to work towards as, as we work with, like uh, Gail said, with Beth and with Molly coming into the classrooms and providing support. Our balanced literacy, as we've heard from Travis and from Gail, uh, and using that high, high quality student data. And I'm sure that Jeff and Ryan have talked to you, this has to be the OTES 2.0 pilot. This all comes together uh, uh, extremely well because that is, those are some of the areas we're now looking where we're not the 50-50 anymore on the uh, evaluations. We really are intentionally making sure that this high quality student data is being, is, is being collected, is being used, and being um, truly guiding teaching and learning. Implementation of the math, math workshop, again, with the high quality student data. Uh, Gail talked about the character education program that was in place, pro obviously, prior to this year of the student pledge. I do want to point out two other um, initiatives we have. One is the ROCKS program, R-O-X, and uh, we have our eighth, um, we have eight, myself included, um, staff members who have been trained, uh, we have two more still going, uh, who will be our eighth in February, and we are bringing these to our fifth graders. Our PTO is kind enough, it is a very expensive program at the initial training, um, but I can tell you it is life changing, and it will be life changing for our students, our, our fifth grade uh, female students. There is not any formal program for males, but we did implement something in Grandview that were, it's called RAISE, for boys that can take place at the same time. So that is something that we're going to develop once all of our uh, staff members who are participating at this point are trained. This is something we would like to see annually. Um, very powerful. And the second uh, area that I would like to say that aligns with this is starting this year, Gail and I, uh, we, we implemented Kid Talks. We meet every single Wednesday. We have seven meetings. Um, because uh, the way that the, uh, our staff has their um, planning time, our staff gives up their planning time every single Wednesday for our kid talks. And we meet at grade level and we discuss students, whether it's social, emotional, whether it's academic concerns, and we brainstorm together. And not, the teachers don't have, because we meet by department, at grade level department, they do not necessarily have all those students in their classroom, but we have all, you know, at first the teachers are like, how is this going to work? What we have found, these are our students. You might not have them in your class, they're all of our students. And our teachers have taken ownership of it. And we brainstorm and we come up with like, uh, ideas to, to implement and implement with fidelity. And we have seen great success where we brainstorm together on how and we monitor the progress of these students. And it has truly been um, a fantastic experience how our staff really are seeing all of our students as, as our community. Uh, and then finally, meet the social, emotional, academic needs of the whole child. That continues to be something that brings all everything that we talked about with our initiatives, our successes, and our areas of growth all comes together to meet those needs. Any questions? Oh, oh we have one more. I felt so good in here. <laughs> okay. Um, our grade level initiatives, like we saw in Travis, uh, uh, elementary school, fourth grade. Uh, we asked our teachers, you know, what would you like, you know, what, what initiatives do you want to continue or to implement increased student ownership of their learning through analysis and reflection using pre and post assessments. Uh, and this is happening both in ELA and in math. Our fifth grade team, they're really looking to continue, again, the math workshop model that, uh, that Travis uh, and Gail talked about, our units of study. And we're looking closely, again, in math and ELA, goal setting with students. This is where we really start to see students looking at their and reflecting upon their own areas of growth and strengths and having them start to set goals with the students to differentiate instruction. And then sixth grade, math, okay, uh, using a combination of freckle with the math practices and math progress to make sure that instruction is differentiated to meet the needs of the individual students. ELA, again, uh, the, uh, the units of study and a goal setting and then science analyze their resources to expand and enhance the implementation of scientific in inquiry. Um, yeah, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I, and, and again, if you look at the goal setting, this is something that, as we know, is some of the best strategies, teaching strategies, 
is that students start truly reflecting and owning their own their own learning. And this goal setting, I, I've been in, well, this week will be my 24th uh, um, observation, and I've been in the classrooms, and, and, and teachers truly are sitting there conferencing with students and talking, okay, these are the goals you're setting. How are you hitting them? What can you do to, to, to make sure that you are meeting your goals? And these, these conversations that they're having with the students are very meaningful, and it's, it's incredible to see these students truly owning their learning. So um, I, I think that I just have to say it. Um, Gail has just done just an amazing job in, in this building. And as we can see from the successes and the initiatives, um, there's, there's some big shoes to fill. Any questions? How is one-to-one -one technology implemented by like fourth and fifth grade? Do the kids have the machine they move with them or take it home? Or is they do it... not take it home, four, five, or six. They do not take it home, <clears throat> but they do move with them. They okay. can go into their classrooms. And I would say that all of our teachers, they even take them into their related arts, their special areas, and use them. Um, music class uh, for you know, world languages. So the students, it's really like um, you know, something that a reason, you know, something that they truly take everywhere with them and it's an extension. And so they charge them up at they, school? Yes. So, uh, in the mornings when they report to their homeroom, they're all assigned a certain number. Okay. So they go, when they go into their homeroom, they go get their Chromebook, and then it's theirs all day. At the end of the day, as they're packing up, they take them back to their homeroom to the yeah. The only kids that uh, take them home would be our sixth graders that accelerate to the middle school. Yeah. And then those students take them home. And, and one more question, what is the student pledge? I haven't heard it, I mean, I should have heard it. The What's student pledge, yeah, you know, uh, I come to school uh, to take care of my learning and make positive choices. Um, the results 
showing the deposit when we want to. Um, so some of the improvement areas that we've noted, um, the overall experience. So if you look at that seventh grade, so those are our current eighth graders. So last year that ended at 61%. So you know we met with groups of kids and we tried to get information from them about what could be better. And honestly, a lot of the stuff we heard was your typical um, transition from like an elementary intermediate setting to a middle school setting where you have seven to eight different teachers depending on your caseload. You have all these classes and notebooks and folders and things like that. And a, a more homework than they had in intermediate school. Um, it wasn't everything, but that was a lot of it. But still, it made us think about well, what could we do. So we've had a lot of talks about homework. And I'm not suggesting that we're not going to have homework. I'm not suggesting that at all. But I do feel like teachers are really thinking about, is it necessary to assign that? Or is this really, what purpose do I get in assigning this? So I do feel like teachers have cut back in some areas when it comes to things like that. Um, stress level, again, um, seventh grade is 60%. We've been hovering there for several years now. Um, the reason you don't see eighth grade up there is because I think it was two years ago, Matt, I can't remember, we changed the correct question at the secondary level. Instead of asking, what is your stress level like, we already know it's high. So instead, for eighth graders, we started asking, how are you managing your stress? How do you cope with it? What do you do? So that's why the, the question is a little different now. Um, so we're working with them. And again, same thing there with staff. The stress levels um, are going in the right direction. And um, again, the academic piece is that um, we have some work to do with language arts and math seven. And math seven is a new piece for sure. Um, but we have so many students that are accelerated that jump up to the next grade level. And so that skews our numbers a bit. And not every district does that. Um, and with LA7, we've been up and down <coughs> years. And um, I've had several different conversations recently with the principal at New Albany Middle School. And she and I have been talking because her eighth grade numbers are kind of like our seven, my seventh grade numbers, and so we've been talking about strategies, getting the teachers together, which we've done with them previously too, but not with so. so um some of the things that we're working on, and again, you've heard from the other principals, um, PBL, obviously, is still something we're working on. And I was really pleased this year to hear so many of my teachers talking about how they were tweaking their PBL or just totally throwing it out and starting over. Um, which is great. And several teachers are also trying to implement a second one, so that's good. Um, in one of my newsletters earlier this year, in the fall, I talked about the um, physical education. Their PBL really changed this year um, to have it promote health and happiness, and it it was just really fun. It was it was busy because for about two or three weeks while the students were working on this, they were constantly trying to do things to better GMS, and so a lot of that depended on me myself or Mr. Graham or Ms. Baker. But I mean, they were great conversations and we've implemented, implemented several things that they've come up with. Um, like for instance, just recently we had to do, um, to help out the high school, because we share the cafeteria. So if one of us is on a modified schedule, sometimes we have to do something funky for our lunch periods. And so last Friday we had to do a modified lunch program where we put all the middle school kids on the lunch, which is actually a normal lunch of high school, but the middle school just aren't used to that yet. So um, a lot of the students get a lot of stress over that. Like over 400 middle schoolers in the cafeteria at one time, which is just a sensory overload for a few kids. So one of the PE students, uh, her project was to figure out a way to fix that because that was just not good. That made her mind, this is just not good, she said. <laughs> <laughs> but she did, she said my office. Um, I said, so what are we gonna do about it? And anyway, long story short, she found teachers who were willing to open up their classrooms, give up their lunch period, open up their rooms so the students could eat their lunch so there wouldn't be 400 some kids in the cafeteria. Um, so truly, she did all the work for me. Um, but it, it, was, it was great working together with the students to come up with that. So now we have our list of teachers who are willing to do that anytime we have that one lunch. And so that's just one example of what came out from that. Um, let's see, uh, technology obviously, one-to-one. Uh, -one. You know, one thing I'll note, I'll note about this though, when we first were one-to-one, -one, it was more of that every month having Mr. Walker, at the time it was Evan, now it's Max, but having him come to our meetings and present ideas and things to us. And we, of course we welcomed them. In fact, two meetings ago, uh, Glenn and Max were there. But what, bless you, what we're 
works more effectively now, we have found, is what are our staff members are doing in their classrooms and then sharing that field with teachers. So at every month, we try to have someone share out some technology to for some program that they can use to share with other teachers. That works well better. Um, the authentic middle school experiences, uh, that's just like a broad term. We're just trying to make sure we're connecting with kids and we're trying to remind ourselves that they are kids. So one thing that Tracy touched upon was rocks, which we have that as well. Um, and I heard you mention something that you're bringing from Grandview with the mail programs. Mm -hmm. So that's something we started researching last year as well, and we really struggled to find a research-based program. So last week I sent uh, Mr. Brown, a uh, team of students, to uh, a conference up in Cleveland. It was called Lost Boys. And so we met, and um, Mr. Carpenter at the high school, his daughter's a school counselor, she found a few programs for me to research. So hopefully here in the second semester we can get together and find something that we can piece together and make our own program because it doesn't seem to be a really rock solid research based program out there for male males. And we definitely are missing that component for sure. Um, so that is something we're working on. We're trying just to do fun things for kids. Um, one of the things that kids mentioned last year is they really miss recess, and I get that. And it's just that movement piece. And so Three days a week now before school, the middle school gym is open. We call it gym rats. And so that's open for the kids to shoot hoops or do whatever they need to do for half an hour. Um, I found a parent who was willing to help out during lunchtime. So they get 15 to 20 minutes to eat. And then if they want, they can come to the gym and have 10 minutes left of their lunch. And so I believe he was actually on the board of dental last month to be approved and all that. But he's willing to help us out with that process. So it's just little things like that. Um, the students this week wanted to have a winter spirit week, so like tomorrow is snow band day, so they're excited about that. Um, student council came to me and they had a bubble gum blowing contest, so that would be after the first year, we were trying to organize that. Um, I wasn't really sure how we were going to measure bubble gums, but it's amazing if you Google that. Wow, there's a lot of information out there, I had no idea, but, so it's just fun little things like that. I mean, that's going to take 15 minutes before school starts using bubble gum. Um, the OTES 2.0 uh, new teacher model. Um, I'm with, I work with Brian Bernath. I'm on the district committee to attend those meetings and bring the information back. Um, for the most part, that's going well. Um, but like anything with change, you have to learn the process and everything. But um, the one big thing I do like about it is that um, we went from 10, 10 items on the rubric for the year, but down to six. So that to me made a lot of sense. The fourth semester graduate, I'm, I won't repeat what everyone else has said that we've already done with the unpacking, but the one thing in middle school that we did decide to do right before school started is to change our um, merit slips. And so now, um, if you will, yeah, you would know, um, that our merit slips in middle school um, are the portrait of our graduate attributes. And so that's what we focus on, and we highlight those in our classrooms. And then the Science of Suicide program is something we're doing with Nationwide Children's Hospital. Um, that is grade 7 through 12, so Matt Durst may speak to that as well. But um, we had our staff training before school. We had a parent session. And then I had to, um, I had to identify eight staff members who would be willing to deliver this curriculum to the seventh graders, because that's the thing <coughs> that we're going to do at the middle school. And I was, honestly, I was really overwhelmed by the number of staff members who wanted to be trained. So in working with um, Melanie from Nationwide Children's Hospital, I'm going to be able to train all the middle school staff members in January because they all just feel like they need that information um, to work with students, even though only eight of them will deliver the information. Um, but it was just nice to know that they all wanted to be a part of it and stay after for 90 minutes to get that information. So I, could, I could say a lot more, but I'm trying. I'm watching my time. <laughs> Lisa, that's fantastic that you get such support for the Science of Suicide program. I think that really speaks volumes about quality and interest in staff. And I know that permeates the whole district as well, the leadership in the building. So that's yeah, it's very just, impressive. yeah, thank you. The wellness piece is something we're really trying to work on. Like, and I'm, I'm just, I mean, it's just amazing sometimes you sit through meetings and what people are dealing with at home that you may or may not even pick up on. And, it's just amazing, and I'm learning that now with the staff, that things that they've got going on in their personal lives, or when they dwell or worry about the trauma that their students are going through, and they take that home and 
something in particular you can point to for that or is it do you think it's more just an amalgamation of all of the things that you're doing to sort of uh, reach out to people? I, I, mean, I, I, don't, I just, I don't know, I've just tried to be really intentional with different individual letters to staff or thank you notes to staff. Um, one of the things they said like, over a year ago was the amount of meetings before school. And you know, if I sit down and look at the calendar, I'm like, I always have a meeting, so I don't think anything of it. But you know, they need time to work with staff. They just need time. Um, so it used to be that there was a team meeting every week, and we've changed that now. So it depends, it depends on the month. Like December is a short month, so there's only one seventh grade team meeting, one eighth grade team meeting. Um, like in October, when it's a full month, there might be two seventh grade and two eighth grade. But I, little things like that, like they were just like overwhelmed with, oh my gosh, like you just have no idea. This give me that free morning once a week or whatever has really helped. Um, so, you know, it's just getting ideas from them, like what can we do? I can't pay you more, I can't give you, you know, I can't create more hours in a day, but what could we do? And so it's just trying to find those ideas. I commend you for that. I think that's sort of, we, we should find ways to spread that, institutionalize that if we can, because there's so much demand on this time. And there, is, there is a lot of stress. The kids are more stressed now than they are. I was too dumb when I was a kid, but now there was something of stress. But I know that it's, it's worse now than it was 5, 10, 15 years ago. It's the same for staff. And as Mr. Brown mentioned, the wellness initiative district wide, I mean, that's certainly it's, it, it's inclusive by the staff. It's in our, our interest as an institution to make sure that we're taking care of the mental, emotional, physical needs of our students and our staff. So to the extent that we can. If we find things that work in a building, and we can extend that outside that building, I think that's imperative. And I'm, I'm just, to add to what, what Mr. Denise was saying, I'm really excited we're taking in advantage of being associated with Nationwide Children's because they're doing some cutting edge, recognized nationally with behavioral health with children. And it's, I mean, it, it's, I think it's great that we're so, so closely connected and it's great to hear how well it's being received by, by our staff. So I, I, think, I think that's terrific. And they're, they're right in our backyard, which is terrific. Um, if there was a secret, uh, I would say that we minimize 
the importance of these tests with our students and with our families. We challenge our students to do their daily work for our classes, uh, and we teach at a level that's higher than the threshold. And then we really let the test results take care of themselves. Uh, but that's always nice confirmation to receive from the outside source that what we're doing um, is meeting their needs in those ways. The, follow, the, the last one here, uh, the final building strength. Um, again, this is one that I'm particularly proud of. Um, more than 90% of graduating seniors, this is over the last two years' worth of surveys, have responded positively. That means agree or strongly agree to the, to the statement I'm prepared for my post high school life. And then on the same survey, 96% of the graduating class of 2019 responded positively to the statement my teachers care about me. Um, if we go back to the creation of the exit surveys, that initial year, uh, it was a kick in the teeth for the high school staff when it came to that idea that my teachers care about me. Um, I believe we were down in the 60% range um, on that response. And so um, Ryan Burnett was principal at the time, and, and all he did was simple. He put it in front of the staff, and he let them take that personally. You know, he didn't stand up and lecture them, but they were unhappy with that result. Um, and then they started to turn that around um, in the way that they connected with kids. So that's one of the things that we're, I think, the most proud of uh, in terms of those exit survey results. <clears throat> Improvement areas, I'm going to highlight two of these. The percent of students using electronic cigarettes continues to be alarming. Um, I mean, that's just simple and straightforward. Uh, particularly with last year's sophomore class, 26% had used an e-cigarette within the last 30 days compared with 12% the previous year. So anytime you see a class of students, now these are different sophomore classes, but, but you can compare some data across classes and say, when they're a sophomore, they're about here. When they're a junior, they're about here. They're, we've seen some consistent numbers. Um, that was definitely one that jumped um, off the survey results to us. And then that second one there, um, no fewer than or no less than 13% of each graduating class responded that they had seriously considered suicide in the previous 12 months. Uh, we've talked about this in the past with State of the Students. Um, this was one of those that we wanted to really zero in on um, dating back to last year when we started to research the Science of Suicide program. Um, and so we really, in terms of building initiatives, um, we have dug in, uh, like Mrs. Norman said, with that Science of Suicide program. Uh, staff training happening in August. And then uh, we will do the implementation with our 10th grade students at the end of January. Um, why 7th grade? Why 10th grade? Uh, would be a, a common question to be asked of Lisa or myself. That is the recommendation of Nationwide Children's uh, in the way that they run the program. Um, Melanie has been fantastic to work with as a liaison from Nationwide. <coughs> and her strong recommendation to us was um, stick with a grade level. Um, and make it a grade level. We're not trying to do this with four grade levels worth of students, because quite honestly, we don't have the triage resources necessary um, to assist in those situations. Um, when you focus and you zero in on one grade level over the course of two days, you can bring in enough mental health professionals that once you kind of uncover something under the stone that you just flipped over, you can deal with that effectively, um, rather than a broad uh, swath that we can't really manage that well. So we focused in at the 7th and 10th grade levels. Um, obviously, continued implementation of the two good for drugs curriculum. Um, this is year, I want to say year four at this point um, of that curriculum. Um, and then, uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, the obvious you know, PDL, POG, uh, and formative assessment practices. Any questions um, from the high school level? Yeah. So um, if you're doing signs of suicide in the 10th grade for the first time in January, what are we doing for the juniors and seniors who are not getting that? And then, and what class are we doing with the signs of suicide? Yeah, so the 10th graders are going to be taking care of in World Studies or, or AP World. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very common sophomore class. Um, the 11th and 12th graders did receive suicide curriculum. Mm -hmm. So we weren't in a situation where there was an absence. We're simply in a situation now where we can be coordinated with the 7-10 approach. Um, it is a, a deeper intervention. I, I don't want to mislead. The 11th and 12th graders will not have had this depth of intervention, um, but it's not like there's an absence um, of that education. And is everybody in a world, like, are all 10th graders in some sort of 
history. Yeah, um, yeah. So we, we actually settled on rolled in AP world because that's very rarely tested out of. Um, you know, if we were looking at a health curriculum, for example, we'd have to answer questions about the kids that take it online or the kids that take it through summer school, um, and that number is far greater than we would see in world studies. Any other questions? <clears throat> I'm going to switch presentations. Go right ahead, I'll, I'll make a few comments. So I, I hope the board sees the through line between the things that you prioritize and the actions that are taken down at the classroom level. Um, I think it's important to understand that you know, governance conversations about, around well-being task force and all of those uh, different data points that we look at then transition to actionable points, um, including you know, balanced literacy, you know, just having a conversation around literacy K6 versus, you know, K3 having one approach and 4-6 having another. All of those conversations started up at this level and then have transitioned down. And I think that the building principals have done a phenomenal job of staying resolute in seeing some of those uh, changes of classroom practice that need to occur happen over time. Uh, because there are a lot of things that can distract us from doing this work on a day-to-day -day basis, but they continue to prioritize it year after year so that actually something changes. So um, kudos to all the principals for their dedication and work uh, in that area. A couple of things real quick just about the CFPs before we get into the state of the students report. Um, you know, we have such great results in Granville on so many things, but it's just really wonderful to see that we're not stagnant. You know, I think the philosophy of CIP came out in all of the reports. And this, you know, day when you guys get to come and talk to us is fantastic. It's one of my favorite things, right? The closer you get to like the students and the things that are actually happening in the classroom, that's what gets us going. That's what keeps people motivated. So the fact that they really are thinking about this and being very professional and intentional with the kind of improvements you're doing is fantastic. You know, especially around the wellness initiatives have really been embraced, and I really like to hear that it's. it's transition to the staff as well because I think it's really a whole community that we need to be thinking about how do we adjust workload how do we you know add extra creative activities of some sort or we're trying to adjust things to make that happen so there's just some great things that are going on with her. Thank you. Great. Mr. Durst let's talk about the state of the students I feel like we just heard half of that. We did we a lot of what you're going to hear tonight um, yes. from the state of the students found itself in the CIP plans. Um, to me, that's a credit to the building principals really taking hold of this information, um, getting it into the hands of their staffs, and then trying to, um, trying to intervene, essentially, to combat what they're seeing uh, from the negative side of things. As you are familiar with, uh, this is the third iteration. This is year three for the state of the students. Um, Ryan Bernath does an excellent job of the state of the schools from an academic perspective. Uh, this really is everything else. Um, on the whole child committee, we often talk about where does our work stop and where does our work uh, begin. And we don't have a clear line for those things. Um, it's hard to say from a whole child perspective, no, that's not something that, that doesn't impact uh, the whole child. So this is a challenge for us. Um, the report has grown since last year. Uh, so I'm going to move through it as swiftly as I can, um, but also uh, please feel free to interject with questions. Um, I very, very much want this to be discussion or dialogue based. Um, it's a challenge for me to hold on to questions until the end of a presentation. Um, so please don't, don't, don't hold back on that. Um, just a reminder, the state of the students truly is the pulse of the students. Uh, it's based on data that is generated on an annual basis. Um, it serves as two things. It really serves as baseline. And now what we're starting to see, which is exciting, is that it serves as trend data as well for a measurement and evaluation. Um, we'll start to see some of these through lines um, as we go through the presentation. Um, to quote Jeff, um, this is a way that we are trying to quanti quantify a quality of experience. And so we're trying to take a look at all of these what, what once have been qualitative measures of experience through a district, experience through a period of time, and we're trying to quantify them numerically so that we can identify these trends um, and we can identify what need to be focus areas. 
Um, the sources of information that we're going to go to with this um, are really three things. Exit survey results, you've seen those mentioned in the CIP. OES results, you also heard those mentioned. Um, and then Jeff talked about Lisa Fitch with her EMIS responsibilities, so we're also going to look at some EMIS reporting data as well. All right, so here's what the numbers tell us. Um, in Granville schools, we are fortunate that, school, that students attend on a consistent basis. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Um, this is a, a, a huge kudos to the parents and the community that we pull from um, because there's an expectation every day that when Johnny gets up, Johnny's going to school um, and the parents are doing what they need to do to get them here. You see that reflected here. That's not something we take lightly. It's very difficult to educate a student who's not in his or her seat. Um, and so this is something that really helps us on those test scores. Our students do feel physically safe. If you see, um, on average, 94% of our students are saying that they feel safe at school physically. Um, I do want to point out, if you look across those columns from 16, 17 to 17, 18, some of those numbers declined. And I want to just remind you, that was following the Parkland shootings. Um, if you go back to um, February 14th, um, that was the date of the Parkland shootings. This is administered the first week of April. Um, so that was very recent um, and very much on the mind of our students in 17, 18 when they were surveyed. You'll see those correcting um, in large part as we move back into 18, 19. Um, so further away from Parkland, um, and we've seen those rebound um, and correct. Um, the emotional safety numbers would be very similar. Um, you're going to start to see, as you, again, you look from left to right, that you see a drop from 16, 17 to 17, 18. Um, and then, again, in large part, you're going to see them rebound as we move away from um, February of 2018. Students feel comfortable talking to an adult at school. Again, this is the pride and joy data, guys. This is, this is what we really, really love to see. Um, right around 85% of our students um, in the district that are serving on this, again, third grade, sixth grade, eighth grade, twelfth grade, are saying, yes, I feel comfortable talking with an adult in school. That's one of those protective factors that we've talked about, but that idea of having a trusted adult um, that they can go to. Students believe school is a positive experience. Um, you'll see there, specifically at the high school level, that we had never asked this question before that. We, just had, we did not have this as a component on our specific exit survey. Um, someone on the whole child committee last year said, hey, why don't we ask this? And everybody looked at each other with blank stares and said, I don't know why we're not asking this, so let's put it on the high school survey. So that's year one for the high school level, um, but you can see there at the other buildings, um, again, at least eight out of 10 students are saying, yes, I'm having a positive experience um, in schools. Another one of those protective factors that we like to talk quite a bit about um, is the connection to extracurricular activities. Now, I will say this. If we're being honest with ourselves, we have to also admit that this is a bit of a double-edged sword. Because, while it's a protective factor, it keeps kids busy. It keeps them away from des undesirable things. It keeps them busy. Um, and so we have to, I think, start to look at this and contextualize wellness as it relates to the busyness or the connectedness of our students. I think that's, that's an evolution for the conversation. Um, and that's something that I'm curious to see how we can get into that conversation with students about how busy is enough busy but not too much busy uh, that we start to see um, the opposite effect. Matt, yeah. on this, I know it's the student survey, but are we going to engage the parents in these conversations as well? In what way? About many, about that we might that they might be overloaded with extracurricular activities. So are you asking me if my GRD third and fourth grade basketball team has students that also play your soccer at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah, I, I, I know, but not only engage the students, but I think we need to I agree with you. what's going on at home. Yeah. Um, as my experience has been, it's not necessarily always the child's first choice to be involved in as much as they are. Right. Right. So I just was curious if that's. Yeah, and, and to Amy's point from earlier, you know, she mentioned, you know, Travis has done a fantastic job with our well notes. Uh, you know, Travis joined, is this probably year three? 
for, for him on the, on the whole chalk committee has been fantastic. Um, has really helped bookend, I think, my perspective, because I don't, I don't have an elementary, elementary <coughs> perspective other than that I've got a student in the building. Um, but, but Travis took on those well notes, um, well, it's been over a year ago at this point, um, and has just done a fantastic job of really trying to pull things, um, not only from the surveys that we use, but also from the books that we're reading at the leadership level. Um, you know, he's pulling from How to Raise an Adult. He's, he's really trying to make those um, as broad and as usable um, as he can. And that's something that we send home every Friday. The hard part um, that I still can't wrap my head around is how do we guarantee consumption you know, from the parents? Um, and I don't, I don't have a fix for that, um, but I can say that we'll continue to make it available to them um, in hopes that not only do they consume, but that they reflect and then they, if needed, you know, modify things. Um, I would put myself in that, in that category as well. I need to consume those, I need to reflect, and then I need to modify my own practice as a parent, you know, as necessary. And I, th I do think it's great we're starting at the elementary level, and if we can continue that the whole time. Because um, having three kids, I, I understand in high school you want the resume to look great and, and those things, but there's times it can, can, in my mind, it can contradict the whole wellness. I agree with that. So, I would agree. It, would, it would be useful to get, I think, as Fred's getting through some of that data, you know, have students account for how much of the time is spent on their extracurriculars, how much of the time is spent perhaps on a, you know, employment, how much of the time is spent on homework every night, how much of their time is unstructured time, just sort of downtime that we all know is important. Be, that, that would be some interesting data to collect. Survey parents would be interested to get their perspective on those same issues. Let's move into some of the challenges that the students are facing. We mentioned stress earlier. Um, we've isolated the elementary school not because we want to point them out, because truly the, the elementary school level and, and Travis's perspective is, is perfect on this. He doesn't want kids in third grade to feel stress. Right? In an academic environment, we, we fight things like the third grade reading guarantee because that's a stress imposition. We really want to move these kids through K3, and we want them saying, man, I love coming to school every day. I love learning. I love interacting with my buddies. Um, I love my double recess, as Henry says, every day. <laughs> um, that's been fantastic. Um, but, but this is one of those things where, you know, as a whole child committee, we said that we want to move towards the idea that we're measuring the management of the stress. And, and Travis said, no, I don't want stress at all. Um, and so I want this question to stay where it is. Um, this has been as high as 52% in previous years. So we had a jump this past year, but we're not where we were six years ago, in a good way. Um, so I want to point that out. Can I just ask a quick question? Yes. Um, when we first started asking this question, did we do some qualitative questioning about like what do, what do students think stress is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's something that Travis digs into. So Isabel Thatcher specifically, um, as the counselor, she, she'll dig into that exactly with the students um, so that they can try to uncover that in a more narrative, qualitative right. way. It'd be interesting just to see what some of the, you know, what they're saying, like what, what stress means to them at that age. Um, it would be interesting to understand. Um, because I don't, you know, for whatever reason, you know, I agree with Travis, we would like to have that. <laughs> I understand that may not be possible, but, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be, I think it would be helpful to understand. And, and I could even lend a second grade eye on this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, Hen Henry, Henry was upset this morning going to school. Um, what is wrong? I don't know what's wrong, Dad. Uh, okay. Well, let's walk to school and see if you can't figure this out. I, sometimes he doesn't even know how to name what that is. Right. Um, so it's just that idea that he's developing even the vocabulary to verbalize that to somebody's part of this as well. Um, <clears throat> as we noted, um, this is the second year now that the intermediate, middle, and high schools have asked the question centered more around coping skills rather than the stress level itself. Um, and, and again, we're, we're seeing what I think would be very positive results here that students are answering back Yes, I do have coping skills to manage that stress. Stress is not going away, it's a constant for all of us. 
um, as we move into adulthood. Um, and so when we know that these students are learning these strategies, to me, that actually speaks more to the fact that we're intervening on their behalf versus just saying, how stressed are you? This, this to me, is there's something tangible and actionable that they're doing with that stress, which I think is very productive. Um, the OES survey um, is given in grades 7 through 12 every year. These are some of these yes, no management of stress options that the OES survey presents to students. This is actually in order um, based on the frequencies that they use to rate these things. I manage my stress through one or more of the following. The students can select more than one. So if, if I manage my stress through physical activity and I limit social media exposure, I could give a yes to each of those things. Um, but you can see that it's very clear, almost 50% of our students are managing stress, stress through physical activity. Um, that's how high that physical activity number is. It really drops off when you get down to avoiding drama, but you're still going to see the majority of those in the teens um, for kids answering positively to that being a stress management solution for them, so to speak. I'm going to let you stare at this one for a couple of seconds. I've, I've given you the through line there so that you can take a look at how much our students are or are not sleeping and the progression that happens. So, so the through line is this, it's the same cohort of students. So if you follow them from 7th, 8th to ninth grade or 10th, 11th to 12th grade, you're starting to see that I mean, when we get to the 12th grade level, we're talking about, uh, well, junior, senior, one in eight-ish students is getting eight hours of sleep. Um, I think this is one of those things that we, we continue to point this out um, in things like well notes. Um, I, I will say this is a real challenge. I, I mean, it's just a real challenge because it's not something that we have 100% control over. Um, and there's no finger, finger pointing needed. There's no finger pointing happening. Because at times, the parents can look squarely at the high school and say, you're the reason that my kid's not sleeping eight hours a night, guilty as charged. But there are times when we can look at the way that our students manage their time, knowing that they're 16 years old, and knowing that I mismanage my own time, and how can we expect them to do this successfully all the time? So, so this is one of those things that I, I have a burden for this number. I don't know how to really move this number. Um, I hope no homework begins help this type of thing. Um, I, I hope we're being more conscious of the homework that we're giving. But I will tell you that when we surveyed uh, health students two years ago, they told us they do about 100 minutes of homework outside of the school day per night. Now this is kids from APs to non-APs, grades 9 through 12. Every night for four weeks we asked them, how much homework were you doing? Um, and so what we got was pretty good grammar specific data that said, they're doing about 100 minutes of homework. Well, even if I've got basketball from 3 to 5 and I go home and do 100 minutes of homework, how am I not getting 8 hours of sleep? Right? So this just isn't easy. Um, but it's something that I want to continue to follow, um, and I want to continue to take a look at that way. You can see here that we've got some, some progressions right through here. Um, and this is the same numbers, guys. I, all I did was put these in different colors for you. Um, <coughs> I, I, I'm throwing Mr. Brown off the bone here. It's been a while since Michigan's been on top. <laughs> and so I, I've color-coded this in his best interest. This may be the only time Michigan's on top. It's not funny. <laughs> as, as we move into tobacco use, you're going to notice um, that we've got a good trend going. And, and we've seen a decline. <clears throat> Don't look at the sophomores. They seem to be an outlier. Okay, so those are the current juniors. Um, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about how the classes change as they go through this. But if you take a look at those senior numbers, I mean, we're down from 17% in the previous senior class to 12%. So, so let's celebrate this, right? Well, this is where they went. Okay, so I, I don't know that it's a celebration. We've seen a migration from tobacco to e-cigarettes. It, it is not only Granville. We all know that. It's not only Granville. But unfortunately, it is Granville. Um, thankfully, um, you, know, you responded about two years ago 
um, with a policy modification to the way that we, we handle tobacco uh, violations, I think that has been very productive. Um, we've seen a tremendous amount of education going out to the parents, to the students. Um, it's not a battle that we're winning yet. I'm just going to be honest. It's just not a battle we're winning yet. And the sophomore number is the one that scares me the most. The education starting early enough, Matt? Because you, you know, I've seen some studies that say you know kids at age 12 Absolutely. are starting this, and, and you know, obviously the, you know, this is a it's a new enough issue that when e-cigarettes first came out, they were pitched as the quote unquote safe alternative Correct. to tobacco, and it's clear that they're not. But you know you had several levels of kids who whether that was a rationale or not, believed it was safe. And then you know, maybe got hooked on the nicotine. So the question is, if we're starting as, to educate them as freshmen, we may be a year or two too late. No, we're, we're starting well before that, thankfully. Um, I, I will say that in the fall this year, I, we saw at the high school level, and I, I just can't speak to the other buildings, um, we saw a shift in parent mindset. I mean, we really did, uh, in a very positive way. Um, I had four or five conversations with parents before the school year even began. They wanted to inform me that their son was addicted, that they were working with medical professionals, that they might need to call in um, some additional help and resources, um, but that, that's never happened um, since we saw the emergence of e-cigarettes. So I personally believe that we're at a bit of a tipping point in our community um, with people being fed up Having the know-how, but then also seeing the undesirable impact. Um, we've had the know-how for a couple of years. We, we, we've cognitively understood that this is not good. Um, but I, I saw a difference this year. Um, so I'm hopeful that that's something that is going to continue to build on itself. Um, the education will be consistent. I mean, that, that's something that's happening year in and year out um, with the students. It's something that we spend a great deal of time on with the students. Um, but again, that, that sophomore number right there um, of 26%, again, we can't compare that cohort directly with the previous sophomores, but if you look at the previous sophomore numbers, they weren't even close to 26%, okay? So what I'm gonna be particularly paying attention to is those ninth graders up there took this survey as 10th graders this year. So I'm gonna, that's the first number I'm going to go find. Is, is, is this something that we're seeing now in two years worth of sophomores, or is that a blip on the radar um, and we're back to uh, a, a kind of corrective curve, so to speak? Um, but that, that's just one of those things that we'll continue to look at. Is that sophomore class the one that's predominantly male? So no, this, is that, so uh, this class is, this way? no, it's not. This is the current juniors. Oh, that's current juniors. Correct. The current sophomores is the one that's like a 65 right. 35 split. The, the alcohol numbers um, have really been pretty stable. Uh, we haven't seen a dramatic increase or movement in these um, in years, honestly. We still continue to see the feedback from students as they respond that the most common place that they're using or consuming alcohol is at a friend's house on the weekend. At a friend's house on the weekend. If we go back to the Pride survey, we were, when we were giving that, gosh, that was 12 or 14 years ago, we saw the exact same thing. If you talk to Dr. Lou Malika, who was the superintendent back in the 80s, it was the exact same thing. That, that's, that's, a, that's a grand deal thing, um, that the most common place and time is friend's house uh, on the weekend. The marijuana numbers, again, have been relatively static, not a huge flux from year to year. But again, there's that sophomore number staring us right in the eyes. Um, that, that class um, seems to be more engaged in these undesired extracurriculars, uh, so to speak. <laughs> um, I particularly love the number um, across the senior level there. You just see a real drop off at the senior level with uh, lifetime misuse of prescription drugs. The, the previous numbers were, were past 30 days. Um, this is always reported as lifetime use of prescription drugs. 
So that's a pretty significant difference between previous 30 days. So that's one thing that I want to intentionally point out. Um, th this was information that we kind of gave verbally last year that, that, that uh, we wanted to put in, um, in writing so it was more of a staple um, in the State of the Students Report annually. Um, you can see there that the random student uh, substance use testing is at no cost to the district, as you're aware. Um, it's funded through the implementation of the student registration parking fee of $40 per parker per student. Um, and, and essentially what we've done is we've taken that parking money and we've dedicated it to student wellness. So whatever we don't spend in drug testing monies, then we return and reinvest it right back to the students through substance free activities, after proms, homecoming dances, um, Friday Night Lights, the club fair, um, any of those things where we can encourage substance free student engagement, that's, that's what we go to um, to provide those opportunities for those students. Digging into the numbers, um, you see there are two years worth of drug testing numbers and results. This is year three for that program. Um, so these are the two historical numbers. You can see that we grew the testing pool from year one to year two. And you can also see that the number of positive tests grew uh, from year one to year two. One of the most common myths or kind of misconceptions as it relates to a drug testing program um, is when someone looks at this, 17, 18 is a great example, and they say, my goodness, you're wasting your money. You only caught one kid. Well, this isn't about catching kids. This is actually about giving them an excuse not to use. Their parents have, have opted them into this, so the students know this is coming. They know that they're in the testing pool, um, and the whole design is that they're going to be able to look at their buddy on Friday night and say, there's no way I can drink that or smoke that because I might get tested on Monday. Um, it's a great excuse to use to get out of that situation. Um, I don't love the fact, honestly, that we grew from one positive test to seven. So I'll be curious to see what that looks like at the end of this school year. Now, we did test more last year than the previous year, but we didn't taste, based on percentage, we didn't test that much more. Um, so that is, a, that is a jump if you're looking at this in a statistical way. And do you have any yeah, yeah, data there on, so those positive tests, those are each an individual violation by a single student, do you have any data on whether there's been a repeat violation or a repeat positive test? Oh, no, because we don't have that in terms of consequences. The, we don't, we're not notified of the first positive. Um, so the only way that we would know of a repeat is if it was actually a third positive if that makes sense. Um, and we don't have those. So, so for, for, for the best of our knowledge, we don't have repeats. Um, because you haven't had anybody. Exactly. Well. Exactly. <laughs> this would include first offense. This number includes first offenses. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not before it goes who it is. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Um, you'll see there that we, we did make a very conscious decision to add a steroid panel. Um, the standard panel tests for 13 substances the steroid panel is 13 plus the steroid. Um, we, we wanted to make sure that we were positive um, that we don't have students you know, using PEDs or performance enhancing drugs. Um, and so there are um, a couple of months of testing where we, do, we only do the 13 plus the steroid panel. Um, it is much more expensive. I, I will say it's, I feel like the, the regular panel may be you know, 20, 30 bucks uh, the steroid panel is 75, 85, you know, 95. It's much more expensive. But it's worth knowing that um, we're tested for that. Um, as we look at drug testing by grade level, I thought this was just a curious look at this that you guys would appreciate. Um, you see there, because, because this is truly random testing, um, we're not going to say that we're equally testing each grade level. Um, because then it wouldn't truly be random. Um, so our vendor, SportSafe, is the one that generates our testing <coughs> list for us. Um, we send them the names of the students who are in the pool. They generate the list uh, about three or four days before our testing dates um, so that we can map out schedules. So we're pulling them out of study hall, we're not pulling them out of class, things like that. Um, and then this is how the, the testing is broken down. The number in parentheses 
is the positive test. So again, just curious by grade level, um, what does that look like and how is that breaking down? Um, the unassigned at the bottom, um, if we have athletes who are homeschooled, who are competing you know, on our teams, and they've opted into the pool, um, then we don't necessarily have them you know, graded in the report that we send um, <coughs> to the vendor, so they just come across as unassigned. Does that potentially reflect participation level, or are you at that? Yeah, Absolutely. So this is this current year, um, and we've actually seen a growth in the number of yeses. That, that, has, that has stuck right around 50-50 um, since year one. And you can see that the, the opt-in um, has grown higher than the opt-out in terms of the testing numbers. Um, and then we did go ahead and break down the grade, uh, you know, the students in the pool. And you can see that at the junior and senior year, this it's opted out more than it's opted in. The one thing that you should know about these numbers is that I can promise you they will change uh, because we haven't had spring sports um, hit their cutoff for making this decision yet. Um, so students who are not in a fall or a winter, um, who are jumping into a spring, um, they're still to make that decision so that, that those numbers will change by the end of the year. Are you, one last question. Are yeah. you yeah. seeing any, any uh, impact on participation no. Or activities that would impact that. No, no. Uh, honestly, the big, if we were talking about something that was going to impact participation, uh, pay to participate has a much greater impact than this does, especially the way that we've written this policy. I mean, we, we've written the policy in a way that if parents choose to manage this at home, that they're, that's, that's permissible, and if they choose to use the school as a resource, then that's acceptable as well. Um, so we don't anticipate seeing a drop in participation. We haven't today either. Um, on the mental health side of things, this is um, we, this is stuff we talked about through the CIP conversations. Contextually, um, I do think it's important for us to note that the, the YRBS, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, um, in 2017, the nationwide average is 17.2 percent. So that freshman number in 1819 is consistent with that national average. The sophomore, junior, senior numbers would be beneath it. Um, the eighth grade, the seventh grade would be beneath it as well. Um, I don't say that to minimize it, but just to contextualize the numbers. This is kind of the flip side of that coin. You know, we've, we've got students who struggle with suicidal ideation. That's why we're targeting signs of suicide high school levels. But then you've got this protective factor where a tremendous percentage of our students are seeking out health care um, or support from a mental health provider. Now, I don't, I don't know that one you know, eliminates the other. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. I would just say that once I've seen the previous slide, um, I'm more optimistic now looking at this slide. Um, as well, because I do think we are economically in a community that can support our students in this way. You know, we can seek out and find mental health support, um, and it's very clear that our students and families are doing that. Um, these are consistently high numbers um, every single year from all six of these grade levels. Just a quick bullet point of summary. Um, our students attend high schools, excuse me, all of our schools, at a high rate. Um, they do feel safe, supported, and connected. They do have positive school experiences, um, but they face challenges. Um, you know, things like rest and sleep, things like stress and substance abuse, and then I think the biggest one that we've all um, really talked about over the last few years is this idea of mental health. Um, the suicidal ideation, the worry, the depression, and the anxiety. There are, some, there are some smaller scale measures that are built into the OES survey. Um, it's called the PHQ, the Patient, patient Health Questionnaire. Um, and and those, those would support the idea that we need to care about worry, depression, and anxiety. Um, we are in the right conversation, um, is another way to say that, where we're trying to really prioritize um, and solve that puzzle. 
In terms of to-dos, um, I mean, there, honestly, this could be five slides long. We're, we're keeping it at one. Um, we're going to really focus in on that science and suicide curriculum uh, that's new to 7-12 this year. We'll continue with the random student drug testing. Um, obviously, the, the policy implementation with tobacco and e-cigarettes, too good for drugs, substance-free student events, no homework weekends, mindset connection. That's that's a specific example of the immediate tax good behavior game, a specific example uh, at the elementary school. Uh, if you want some fun reading, take a look at qualitative research and longitudinal studies with the tax good behavior game. It, it's amazing um, the benefit that we get from Travis and the elementary school's work um, with tax good behavior game. I mean, Hopkins has studied adults that had tax good behavior game as first graders. Uh, they've done some really amazing follow-up studies that point to a lot of really, really good benefits from the implementation of that program because of the focus on self-regulation. Um, it's really very impressive. Um, we will obviously continue to monitor stats and data through OES um, and exit surveys. Um, and then uh, I think the things that are right closest um, to, to, to this board, the ongoing awareness efforts through the whole child committee and that work, um, but then also the well-being task force as it relates especially to student wellness and success. You know, Jeff has shared um, ideas about what to do with that student wellness and success money. Um, and I think we're all interested to see the impact that that makes on our students. That's all I have.
surprised that the similar stress level for freshmen in high school mm -hmm. because that transition is not, not a building change, mm -hmm. at least not a wholesale building change, but um, I guess it's a transition nonetheless. Mm -hmm. We have been in those students who take class in high school right. so that that transition, mm -hmm. I mean, I know for my son it was made a difference that yeah. he didn't really feel it at all because he's already had only been taking classes there. So, that's why I'm a little surprised mm -hmm. stress level. And we've said done such a good job lately getting the academic program to integrate across the buildings, right? And I think that's been fantastic. I see the same thing happening in wellness, and I see conversations happening amongst the principals, and it's really healthy because, you know, like you said, the seeds that you sow in elementary school are really the ones that matter throughout the whole, the whole progression. So it's great that, you know, in all aspects we've got Did you like want to? Um, I know uh, Matt and and um, Gail joke about you know <laughs> the the younger grade buildings <coughs> having a stepchild child at the high school, but you know the you know, high school is only as good as it is because you know, you know the rest of the you know the rest of the grades are as good as they are. So um, I know we tend to highlight a lot of things that happen in high school, but you know it is only as good as it is. Yeah. Um, sure. What happens before it? No doubt. About it. We have more measurables. Yeah. And, and I don't know whether to some extent the, the, the solutions and the things that things are kicked around around like over scheduling, you know, too many sports, too much homework at the same time. Is it, I'm not sure if the solutions are the same, but maybe there are some common solutions that will help our community, like including our students and our everyone and our staff, think about like that time balance and how that's managed and the stress we whether it be you know, recess or whether it be some kind of extracurricular that would be less stressful extracurricular. So I think that you know, it's important to have a lot of time to push kids, and that's a wonderful thing for them to have. But I wish you know, if the first thing that they do is a stress relief or it's physical activity, right? Let's find a way that they can do that without the pressure of a score or a force or a coach or something like that. Maybe there's other solutions like recess, again. Maybe that's a stress relief. Like how do we get those kinds of things, you know, across the board? Like maybe there might be some unique solutions that we're just starting to open up by looking at the data and by coordinating across the board. Like that. I, I think that's a great point. One of the areas where it seems to be we sort of there's this cut line, if you will, for kids that are in as they get older in high school. You know, and I know this from some experiences my own kids had played the rec sports you know, all the way through sixth or seventh grade um, and then weren't you know, devoted enough or good enough or what have you to maybe play high school or call it basketball or, uh, or anything else. There wasn't an alternative. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's getting a little ahead of ourselves, but obviously if the, if the rec department is, if the rec commission is successful in their endeavor to build a new facility that will add some additional facilities. We, we don't have excess facilities now in order to create things, but it would be wonderful to see a you know, Thursday night high school pick up basketball for anybody who wants to come. Um, you know, an open gym type of thing. The same things that, that Lisa Orman was talking about for 7th and 8th graders, because there are high school kids who I think do that if they can come and just play and, and, and get out and get some exercise. And it's not about going to practice every day. It's not about well, GRD is trying to do that. I mean, their biggest challenge, they, they have more kids that would want to do it, but there's, there's no space. Yeah. I know they've been working with Hawaii to do some things, but because there, there are kids that would like to play in a rec league. Yeah. You know, just even if it's Saturday morning, they just go out and do it. That's the biggest challenge. And to play hockey where it's being played game of the night. It doesn't work for them. Yeah. I think it's fine. But I would I just love to see that sort of stuff. Yeah. It's just anecdotal, but we had to take you to high school. Yeah. And I think that was a great release. For whatever it was, 40 minutes in high school, you went and you ran around and did things. And I, think, I think some of the things that we've done in the elementary school 
I mean, maybe not at that level, but it could be done by the level of law. And I'm sure there's something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we could, yeah. and there's an equivalent to be done at the middle school and high school. Oh, they don't want Yeah, because, you know, yeah. Like they, they used to do those things, and then right. they sort of get busy and right. do other things. Right. But I'm sure they were just as trained high school would enjoy it. There's a little club right now that it is full. I walk in on a given day and the senior lounge is full of kids hanging out. I mean, just those making opportunities for those communal activities to, to build connections. I think the more we can to do that, the better. When Jim and I, you and I have had this conversation before, but there's not a lot for a kid to do around here, or a high school kid to do on a Saturday night. Um, you know, there ought to be ways that we can create some of those opportunities again, whether it's in the gym. Mm -hmm. Or a movie club, or something like that. Uh, I just, I, I think there, I think there are approaches there. I mean, I, I, look, the, the overall challenge is a huge challenge. There's not enough time. There's too many activities. There's too much pressure. Kids feel like they need to do certain things. I don't know that we can narrow that down. I think we've, we've talked about homework, and I think we do need to find ways to manage the homework a little better. And it's not that you know, taking Matt's uh, analysis that. It's not that there's more than 100 minutes in a given time that, that may be manageable, but in, in my experience, in Grammy, it's an end size of four in, in, for my high school students. There are some nights there's 20 minutes, and there are some nights that there's two hours and 45 minutes. And yes. finding that balance is a challenge. And, and I know that requires a lot of coordination, but, but that ought to be something that can be addressed so that, so that we, you know, we can manage it at a level that doesn't create one a.m. Uh, bedtimes on the nights when two hours and forty-five minutes. But you know, you know, with Ethan, you know, he's got you know, he's got hockey practice on Monday and Wednesday nights. He gets home at eight eight thirty at night, and he's got two and a half hours of homework. Which you know, he doesn't get to bed Wednesday nights before twelve thirty one o'clock most nights. It's it's not that he has that same level of homework every night. It just seems to happen. But, so I think there I think there are things we can do there. The other thing I would say, and Jeff, you and I have had this conversation. The data is overwhelming. Well for high school. It is a challenge logistically managing it. You know, it's, it. It may not be something we can do on our own. Maybe it is. I don't know. I would, I would, I'm certainly not going to have a vote on it. But, but it ought to be something that I think is looked at seriously. Um, but even making a later start time in and of itself doesn't ensure the kids are going to get more sleep. Because the, the later start time means a later finish time means a later homework time. I think it's got to be part of the package, but it really goes back to the whole theory that you have. I commend you on this on the, on the wellness initiative overall, which is how do we look at the whole package? Everything the kids are doing, physical activity, emotional health and well-being, um, managing stress levels. I mean, to me, there is nothing more important that, that we can do as, a, as an educational institution than address that and, and preparing kids for managing those, those levels of life. So, I am really encouraged by what's going on with the, well, the wellness initiative. I'm encouraged by the fact that Governor DeWine came out this week and said he's not going to cut the money back next year. And, and, and I know, you know, not for publication, but he did cut the money back to find ways to, to keep those resources going in that area. But I just think that that is, that is the challenge for this generation. And how do we manage that? How do we, we work in the ways that we address substance use or e-cigarettes or whatever, all of that is part of a comprehensive package that are no easy answers, but, um, but I'm just encouraged by the work that's going on and, and, and the fact that folks in the community are involved and I continue to believe that the more we involve, more members of the community in that space, uh, the, the better chances of success for that. One thing that... <clears throat> I took away from it. There's outside factors besides homework, what is, what yeah. kids are kids sleep. And so I, if we can dive into that, I mean, are they playing? I mean, these, these things are foreign to me. This Fortnite, what do you play? I mean, you can play games now with people all over the world, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that, that, that the devices <coughs> have to go down too. I mean, and shut those off at some point. 
So. Yeah. Having had conversations with kids, they said, yeah, I think I might have done a lot sooner quicker if I didn't have my phone. Yeah. Having that, yeah. Again, teaching, teaching that. Yeah. Right, working on that. But I'm glad we're aware of it. Yeah. That yeah. It's, it's not just too much hard work for it. No, it's so not much, just. But that's a part of it also that, that needs to be looked at. I think that's well said, but I think there's a lot there. And then, you know, Matt's been pretty dead over 100 hours of the 100 minutes of homework, like, well, what are the other minutes? You know, how do you drive into like what those are? And maybe they're out of our control, maybe they're not, but just to have an awareness of them helps us manage. Yeah. Right? Uh, the art pieces of this. Yeah. I think, uh, I think that's right. I think we have to build competency at managing time. You know, mm -hmm. if you think about the, one of the greatest challenges, we prepare our kids really well. We go, graduate and go to college, I know from my own children's experience, they're extraordinarily well prepared. Their biggest challenge is always time management. Because, it, you know, for all the things that we that, that they have on their plate now, it is structured. And you you know this when you go away to school, it's not structured if you can't put your own structure in place. And so, I think building that competency and managing the time, you know, it's, it's hard. I can't manage the discipline of my life on when I look at her. But, you know, in my idealistic world, Switching topics. Ed Choice Bat. Okay. <laughs> Keeping it very simple. Ed Choice Bat. Uh, there is a property transfer uh, piece of legislative art that was embedded in conference committee during the legislative process on the budget that also is, is bad. Um, it could impact us. Potentially, if it's not changed, uh, there is a concerted effort to, to change it. There is a resolution to support uh, a school district that is going to be challenging that um, piece of legislation. So I just wanted to put that on your radar as why we're passing the next resolution um, in the action agenda. So, but I'm going to keep it at that. It's bad, bad. Um, Um, I don't work. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say thank you. Um, I am so grateful for this experience. Um, I, mean, I, I, I got involved years ago, as I said at the time, because we were big consumers of the product. I found mean, four kids in the schools. And I felt like, you know, in, in some ways it's an obligation. And not an obligation in a negative way, but not believing it. It has been enormously gratifying. Um, the work, obviously, is important, and I've enjoyed it. Uh, intellectually, it's been more than I can handle, as you know. Uh, but it's it's been it's been good. But the relationships uh, and seeing the growth and the change in Jeff, I think I was less than six months on the board when we hired you. And we had the conversation about Granville's test results, which were great, bad, uh, and it, you correctly pointed out that. That's not indicating everything that matters. Um, the conversation about good enough isn't. Uh, and that started a continuous improvement, uh, which you continue to this day. I think the combination of continuous improvement and always keeping the focus on what's best for kids uh, is really, really the, you know, the, the true North Star for this community and the school district. Susan, and she was early in her career as a second grade teacher. I remember seeing, you know, she, she'd work nights and weekends, or she'd work, you know, over the summer, and, you know, she'd spend her own money decorating the classroom and providing stuff for kids, and I thought, yeah, that's really amazing. And it was, but what I soon came to find out, she wasn't unique in, in her field. Um, I think she's special, but, but there were so many people who were committed to that, and still are. I see those folks in this district every day, and whether they're kids when they come in the door, whether they're maintaining our buildings, whether they're out, outside on the yard, or athletic field, driving the buses, teaching in the classroom, working with kids after school, commitment level from the 
folks, uh, the professionals in the Granville Center Village Schools is just outstanding. And, and uh, it's what sets this district apart. I mean, yes, we have kids who are very well prepared and who, whose families place a premium on education. But we have staff that are difference makers. And, uh, I wish I could communicate that better to all of them. That's been just so amazing for me to be able to watch up close. Uh, and the administration has been terrific. Uh, working with you, Brittany, working with you, with your predecessors in the Treasurer's Office. We, we could not have been better served by more competent, devoted professionals and better people. It's just been, uh, I don't think folks in this community know how. It's a public, really a public trust, and you own it in every positive way. So, uh, so I've been just honored to work with you, so I thank you for that. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's next? Order reports. Uh, Mr. Wolf. Wolf. Okay, I'm going from memory because, of course, I walked out of the house without my notes about the foundation. But what, what I wanted to report on was they uh, awarded um, their first half of their, their grants, and I believe it was almost $11,000. They had, um, I think it was they, they gave 11 grants, if I'm right, but they had like 24 applications. And It wasn't a matter of, uh, it, was, it was tough for the, the committee to pay. So they're very happy with what um, the reception they get, the, the feedback they get back to the teachers that apply to. And so that, that process seems to be going very smoothly. That um, they're, they're happy to, to explain to them why they didn't get it this time or, and that kind of thing. Or here's what you might have been missing that we were looking for and those types of things. So. Sometimes it changed because it's something that in the past they had trouble getting applications. Right. So they, I don't know what changed in the process, or so maybe there's right. there's increased demand, which is yeah. great. You know, and I, I, I think they, I think they've made a concerted effort to really get into the schools um, and get the word out. Okay. And, and then they also did their, um, I guess you call it their fundraising drive, and they were ahead of last year, um, as far as that goes. And if you don't mind, I've got, I can give some brief details on the athletic complex if that's appropriate. Um, the the <coughs> bleachers are gone. National Trail waste took them, um, which saved money. Um, the press box is down, so which is good. Um, Fundraising wise, it has gone fantastic. I mean, we've heard it before, Sally Hackman. Co-chairman that have done a fantastic job, um, especially with the large donors, um, and they've raised enough money to reach the match that uh, Mrs. Reese so generously with the Gilbert Reese Foundation. Um, they've done, um, the, the, as I call it, the grassroots, which is led by uh, the athletic boosters, which are Rogers and arts boosters, and Wild wow, fantastic job um, and that's going extremely well. Um, they've been making a push since I'd say post Thanksgiving just to make make sure people have that opportunity before the end of the year to participate and there's been a really good response with that. Um, Brittany has been a huge help working with Janelle and Sally um, especially on the accounting and the bookkeeping. Um, Making sure that the, I, I'm I'm very impressed by the communication that's going on in the public-private partnership. Um, I had a conversation with Brittany before she came on board. We 
where it sounded like she didn't have it. It wasn't a good situation before. And I'm, what I hear from you and from the, the volunteers is a really good situation, which makes me really happy that that partnership's going well. Um, and I'd, I'd be neglectful to that. <coughs> point out Don Eggleston, Mike Schmidt, Mike here, but for all their volunteer time with marketing and promotion. It, it's great to see folks that were so involved in the levy. Um, in a way, we found something to continue their their involvement, and, and they're really enjoying it. So um, I, I think the project's going going really well, um, and I'm, I'm excited about it. And I think there's some excitement in the, in the community about it as well. So that's it. Oh, and I and pardon me. Have to acknowledge the village. Because they went waived the water and the tap fees for the stadium, so that was very generous of them. And you know, every little bit helps on this, so we're excited that one of our partners is, is actively involved with this. That's a great point. Any questions? Action agenda. Okay. Uh, action item eleven point oh one is the establishment of the president of the town for the organizational meeting. Steve is our most longest tenured. And it is late. I could not. <laughs> so, and I'm going to stop. <laughs> Discussion? Campaign speech? <laughs> Uh, budget bill 
only in the summer. Um, it does have implications for townships that have multiple school district boundaries within them, um, and basically stripping the, the ability to control the boundary um, in its in the previous language that was associated with ODP and, and the um, school districts having some ability to stop or, or engage in that process. Um, that is now out of the hands of both jurisdictions, which is problematic. So, what's that? Who introduced it? So, it was entered, well, uh, the, I don't know who in conference committee introduced it. But it was a byproduct of a situation up near um, North Canton, um, the Hills and Dales community, um, which is a very, very wealthy community. And they um, wanted to move their subdivision to the adjacent school district that would be less tax for them. Um, so there's all kinds of, but this, I think this is, I've said this probably 50 times publicly, this is what happens when people um, legislate in conference committee. It's a bad practice. It doesn't see the light of the day, light of day, and I think it is something that people have to then backwards engineer and fix to address for legislation. Which you know I've advocated for that practice to stop, um, but here we are again. Is there support for reversal? Yes. There, there are, I mean, this impacts about 500 school districts. Oh, yeah. So um, there is signif a significant push going on, but we want to make it formal. So we, what we will do is we will give this resolution to Kevin Miller of FASA, who is our uh, legislative um, liaison, and he will then deliver those to the appropriate also copy our local legislation. Yes. Yeah. We've had I've had conversations here with them honestly. Any comments or questions? Good deeds. Aye. Dr. Foreman? Aye. Mr. Wolf? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Janine? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaking of OSBA, uh, eleven point oh five is our annual membership to the Ohio School Board Association. Second. I have nothing to add. Mr. Mellon? Aye. Dr. Foreman? Aye. Ms. Deeds? Aye. Mr. Wolf? Aye. Mr. Deeds? Aye. 11.06 uh, is the Ohio School Board Association's Legal Assistance Fund membership. Mm -hmm. Second. Are they engaged in this? Yes. Mm -hmm. Ms. Deeds? Aye. Mr. Wolf? Aye. Mr. Foreman? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Jones? Aye. 11.07 is the revised MSA contract for the athletic complex. Second. Second. Okay. So um, as the scope and the original bid went out, um, the contract for MSA originally was 9% flat fee. Um, because that scope has increased, they um, adjusted that point above where they originally agreed down to seven and a half percent so that um, we could have some savings in the increased uh, scope of the project. So um, it is still an increase, but we wanted to at least get it in front of you and let you know that you know, costs are creeping, um, which they always do in athletic projects, including soft costs related to this. There was some willingness for them to adjust the rate down to help us in recognition that, that the project is costing us more. So that's why we're bringing it back to you. Question. So it's a nine to seven percent of the overall, you said? Yeah, so it's nine to seven and a half. To seven and a half. Above the so original it's threshold. Nine per their fee is nine percent of the original construction okay. costs mm -hmm. and then the Seven and a half percent is of the construction cost beyond the original right. bid. Is the construction cost gone up that much? Yes. Um, so that's like we, twenty percent. We hit it. We so you go out to bid to get the costs, um, and then 
through that bid process, either change orders or orders are made, material costs are coming in, or you know, code requires you to make specific changes. Well, we're we're in that world. Now I believe that we've had the major change order from base bid to revised bid now. So I think we know the full magnitude. Um, I'm going to come back to you with an update on the project probably in January, but give you, you know, I, what I would say new totals um, so that we can plan appropriately if necessary. Okay. Any questions? Dr. Foreman? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Ms. Keats? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Consent agenda, 12.01, and approval. C, I second. Okay. Um, we have our standard items, um, including several donations. For the previously mentioned GIS archery, um, we have a couple of resignations within the athletic program, and then also recognize that um, you know Mike Bate went through the national board certification process several years ago, um, and we still offer that stuff. <coughs> Considering he's also stayed this whole time, <laughs> I thought I'd call him out independently.
the approximate total magnitude of the contract? So the payment actually comes through Medical Mutual, so we don't actually pay it, so it's hard for me to articulate that because we don't actually cut the check to Gallagher. Um, I could give the dollar amounts through. Yeah, I'm just kind of curious if you yeah. require that. Just like that. Thank yeah. you. Ms. Deeds? Aye. Mr. Wolf? Aye. Dr. Foreman? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Jeans? Aye. Someone want to make a motion? Negotiations with our new sessions for public employees. Uh, sure, I would like to invite Cecile Shaw to join us. Now, that may not be something you think of. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>